Whether it's Yavin 4 or Endor from Star Wars or Pandora from Avatar, science fiction has shown us many planets with life that were actually moons. But as science began showing us our first real exomoons, we may discover that some already have life on them or may make good candidates for future settlement. Earth has one of the largest moons in the solar system, and the only moon of significance around a rocky planet. Indeed our moon is 5 or 6 times more massive than Pluto, while Jupiter and Saturn's largest moons each have nearly half the mass of Mercury. Now the reality is that our solar system is probably not a very representative example of what there is out in the Universe. Indeed Earth's moon has long been suspected of being particularly anomalous and possibly a critical factor in why Earth has life. But with the exception of our moon around our planet, which may or may not be bizarre in galactic terms, we have every reason to think that a planet as big as Jupiter could have moons which are fully as big as Earth. We have even found thousands of planets bigger than Jupiter, most of them warmer and closer to their star than Jupiter. Now that's probably not the norm either, any more than 7 feet or 2 meter tall humans would be, but they sure are easy to spot in a crowd. In our hunt for exoplanets we see the biggest and brightest worlds that tug on their star most easily, indeed it's very likely that the first exomoons we spot will disproportionately be the big and warm ones orbiting big and brightly lit gas giants. This raises the question of if life could naturally arise in systems similar to Earth but on their moons rather than on planets themselves, and whether or not we should choose to colonize these systems, and that is what we'll look at today. First, we should start by asking what the fundamental difference between a moon and a planet are, and for that matter a double planet. This is a little tricky since we don't have a fully agreed upon definition of a planet, generally, any large body orbiting a star directly is a planet, any body orbiting another which in turn orbits a star is a moon. It is trickier in a binary planet case where two bodies orbit each other. Also if you're curious, a moon can have a satellite too, or sub-satellite, Though stability can be tricky, this is usually called a submoon, but there are a number of terms suggested for that, from moonitos to moonettes to moon moons, or moons with four O's, and I want to contemplate them today too, along with a double moon, and a good fictional example of this would be the Death Star 2, which orbited the exomoon of Endor in Star Wars. But the real difference from a planet to a moon are that its day length is essentially the time it takes to orbit its planet that it can be tidally heated by that planet significantly, and that it will almost inevitably be tidally locked to that planet, the submoon and double moon cases being examples of exceptions. To see what that truly means, let's imagine I live on Endor for the moment. I recently let my kids see the old Ewok films, so I am reminded how much I would hate living there and that canon wars over Star Wars predate the prequels or Disney films. Now, details are scarce and inconsistent on the world, as it is fictional. Incidentally, we will use the term world generically for any planet, moon, dwarf planet, or even very large space habitat, but Wikipedia tells me it has a rotational period of 18 hours and orbits every 402 days, which I'm assuming means that that's the planet's time orbiting its sun, irritatingly also called Endor, though we'll call them Endor Prime and Endor Sun for simplicity. This is a decent inference, as the moon of Endor would be expected to orbit Endor Prime in the same amount of time it spun on its axis once. We expect very nearly every naturally occurring moon to be tidally locked, always showing the same face to its planet. This amusingly means that one side of the moon can always see Endor Prime, and the other never does. A civilization on the outer hemisphere of that planet gets the same daylight and nighttime as the other side but would never see that planet or know of it till it reached its age of sail perhaps, which might be quite the shock to them when they first saw it. The other half of the moon would be the inner hemisphere, always pointing to the planet. That planet is vastly larger in the sky than the actual sun is, and solar eclipses might be very common events, potentially daily, and far longer than the brief ones here on Earth, when our moon briefly eclipses the sun. Indeed, this will be the darkest time they have, given that during their nighttime, their planet will be glowing far more brightly than our moon does, being that it's so much bigger. We are told Endor has a diameter of 4900 kilometers, barely a third of Earth's, and if we assumed Earth's density, Endor would mass about an eighteenth of what Earth does, and about four times what our own moon does. That is probably being generous too, 
Earth is the densest known object in our solar system, and the densest known moon, Io, is only 60% as dense, probably owing to it being the closest of Jupiter's big moons, with an orbital period of 42 hours, causing it to be a tidally racked volcanic world, spewing lighter elements from its volcanoes. If Endor did have such a density, Earth's, its gravity would be around a third of ours on its surface, and more like a sixth if it was comparable to Io. This is not a good candidate for hoarding an atmosphere, though we're told and shown that Endor has a breathable atmosphere. The other thing to keep in mind is that unless Star Wars standard hours are way different than ours, that is one very fast orbital period. Of Jupiter's 60 or more moons, only four are closer to Jupiter than the Galilean moons, the big visible ones, and only they have periods of 18 hours or fewer, with Io being next at 42 hours, Europa next to double that, Ganymede next to double that, and Callisto slightly more than double that at 16.7 days. And again that's how long the Sun takes between sunrises too, minus some mismatch in terms of sidereal orbit versus solar time or planet time. Incidentally it's quite common for multi-moon systems to be in orbital resonances where the period of one is an integer multiple of another. Now the more massive a planet is, the shorter it takes an object to orbit at the same distance from its center, or the Berry Center anyway, as orbit goes on the combined mass of the system not just the planet. Jupiter's got a huge mass and is fairly standard for gas giant density, with Saturn having a very low density, making it rather wide in size and probably explaining why its nearest moon takes almost a full day to orbit, while Saturn's closest satellite takes just 7 hours. We don't know the mass of Endor Prime but it makes matters easier if it's a lot more massive than Jupiter. Orbital period goes with the inverse square root of mass, so quadruple the mass, half the orbital period at the same distance from the primary. A Jovian that is 9 or 16 times more massive than Jupiter, having earth size or endor sized moon seems entirely plausible, and Io would orbit those at a third or a quarter of its current rate of 42 hours, 14 or 10 hours, meaning a bigger moon that was at the 18 hour mark would probably not be the volcanic death trap Io is. I probably do not need to point out that Endor isn't very scientifically realistic regardless. Even if its primary was on the hazy line between Brown Dwarf and Red Dwarf, a period of 18 hours is going to be dubious while allowing that world not to be shaken like a ball of jello. Of course it might well have been pretty volcanic and maybe derived its thicker atmosphere from that, hard to say, as all life on the world was presumably wiped out a few days after the Death Star 2 exploded right next to it which ended the dual abomination of the Empire and the Ewoks. At 24 hours is more viable as a probable Earth-like exomoon but mostly only around brown dwarfs. Realistically if you need that day length, go find a planet, which arguably is what the moon of a brown dwarf would be anyway given that they are failed stars. That potentially leads to the question of what you call a body orbiting a stellar remnant, though I think planet still applies and if we need any differentiation in a multi-star system in terms of what we call an object orbiting one star as opposed to another, or one that orbits both, the word planet would do but I'd speculate that civilizations that arose in such systems would have specific wars for each of them. Native environments like that certainly have an impact on culture and life. For instance, most habitable moons, or Gaian moons for shorthand, probably have a day length somewhere between a couple of Earth days and a week or more. Generally we consider something a potentially stable orbit as moon or submoon if its orbital distance from the planet is no more than a ninth of the orbital distance that planet is from its star, that is a very loose rule of thumb incidentally. That does mean though that you could potentially have life arise on a submoon of a Hycian planet, orbiting a brown dwarf, that was binary to a red dwarf, which in turn orbited an F or A type star, which in turn orbited a giant though for life to have arisen it would have had to have had enough time pass for that giant to either have been turned into a neutron star or a black hole. And yes, planetary systems can survive supernovae, they just tend to have their surfaces blown off and need to recool, but that sort of event could cause a lot of moon or submoon formation in the process. That is a very unlikely system to exist, let alone for it to be stable, but not super unlikely and it would mean the satellite of a satellite of a satellite of a satellite of a satellite and I suppose we could add on to that by having it be orbiting a dwarf galaxy remnant which is gravitationally bound to a medium sized galaxy that is slowly being absorbed by a bigger one. It is pretty hard to say what qualifies as typical out there, but we suspect places like Jupiter's moon Europa of having life because it has tidal heating that would allow its suspected subsurface oceans to be churned up and given energy that would permit life to form and survive. 
Maintaining an open sky atmosphere like Earth has, or Endor has, before the blast remains of the Death Star crashed into it, is harder. And yes, for Star Wars enthusiasts, I am aware they eventually did acknowledge the possibility of Endor Holocaust to retcon that the Rebels put up all sorts of shields and tractor beams to save the Ewoks. But unless they were a lot less tardy than the writers retconning that, which seems unlikely since that would have been mere hours and they would presumably have been still fighting the Imperial fleet or rescuing all those damaged ships, then I don't buy that. Admittedly I might be biased, I hated the Ewoks as absurd and consider them an irritating stain on otherwise excellent film. Can life be comfortable with a day that is 48 hours, or a whole week, 168 hours? I think so, though it would be hard to adapt to that as a colonist. For natural life, the big issue is that it makes photosynthesis less appealing as a power source, since it means a need for longer storage times for your sugars while you wait for more sunlight, while at the same time your tidal heating sources should be much stronger. The reflected light of the planet the moon orbits, huge though it may seem in the sky, isn't likely to reflect enough light to run photosynthesis, though we could imagine a moon whose ecology was driven by the unequal but significant power sources of sun, tidal heating, and reflected planet light, for the inner hemisphere, which is very hard not to call moonlight as it fills that functional hole only far, far brighter. In any event, I do not see 48 hour or week long day lengths as a major hurdle to life in and of itself or civilization. There is an interesting look at that on Colchis, the homeworld of the Ward Bearers in Warhammer 40,000, which was a planet and one three times bigger than Earth and with a 170 hour long day, just over a week, and a 4.8 year long orbit of its sun. There, the human colonists have developed a different calendar over the centuries. And with a day lasting seven times what ours is, they had seven sub-days. Dawn away, morn day, long noon, post noon, dusk eve, cold fall, and high night. Which would make more sense than just having your dawn be called Monday and progressing through the week until the sun sets on Fridays. I don't recall if the world is described as having much seasonal variation, though if it had much axial tilt and five year long years, you would have some very big variations by latitude and temperature in your year long winter where the sunshine might only last a quarter of your week-long day. That planet does not sound like a nice place to live, but the only book I know that was set there doesn't describe it as even vaguely pleasant anyway. Moons might have similar issues as they don't have a classic season, their axial tilt is with respect to their planet, not their sun, but they would definitely have parallels, although probably more muted in most cases. For instance, a moon with a week-long day is very plausible, and for those living in its terminator with respect to the planet, much as with a planet tightly locked to its sun, that planet will rise and set a bit due to libration. This means that some parts of the moon would get to see their planet or part of their planet and how much they saw would depend on both the time of day and time of planetary year. Libration comes in a few types and basically comes down to the fact that orbital mechanics rarely involves perfect circles and that planets and moons are roughly spherical, not perfectly spherical, and not point-like objects. Which means if you and I are both on the other side of Earth at dawn and dusk looking at a full moon, I'll be looking at the moon at a slightly different angle than you, same for two folks standing on the north and south pole. This is libration in longitude and latitude respectively. The moon is not in a circular orbit but rather a rough ellipse and orbits Earth at an angle, and so bits you see, in spite of being tightly locked, alter a bit from that too. Also, while something tightly locked does orbit a planet as often as it spins, Things spin on their own axis at a constant rate, same number of degrees per hour, but their orbital velocity does change. We move around the Sun faster when we're closer to it, and the same for the Moon with regard to us, so even though the same face stays with us in general, it will lag behind as the Moon is falling closer to us and will catch up later, and as a result we will see a slightly different face. All in all, we can see 59% of the Moon from Earth, so long as we are patient and mobile in our observations. And this same sort of thing will apply to tightly locked planets around suns and to exomoons around planets, which act as very bright moons for them. These are not going to be analogous to an Earth season in intensity, but they would be noticeable and likely still have a biological impact, but surely a cultural one. Again though, none of this would be a barrier to life there, but it would be a headache for colonists to adapt to and we need to be mindful of that in fictional portrayals. Pandora, the setting of the film Avatar in its recent sequel, is a near-Earth moon fictionally set to orbit Alpha Centauri A, 
also called Rigel Kent in the real world, as we were discussing a few months back in our episode Journey to Alpha Centauri. Pandora has no submoons of its own, but is one of 13 moons orbiting the primary planet, the gas giant Polyamphus, reportedly slightly smaller and denser than Jupiter. We are told Pandora has a diameter of 90% of Earth's and is 0.72 Earth masses, making it basically identical in density to Earth, with 80% normal Earth gravity and a slightly thicker atmosphere, though at a lower pressure and a much different composition, and apparently the book The Science of Avatar lists it as a 26 hour day length. I don't own the book so I've only got that as a secondary reference from someone saying so on Reddit, along with Pandora not being tidily locked to the planet, so grain of salt especially as the author is Stephen Baxter, one of the precious few sci-fi authors who knows his science and mostly sticks to them in his books, so I'm going to guess he did his legwork and gave either proper values or had some necessary hand wave to match something forced in by the storyline. Again, unless the gas giant was on the brown dwarf scale, having a 24 hour day and not being a tidally racked death ward would be a stretch. Though if it is not tidally locked, which we could contrive an explanation for, then any number of day lengths are available just like with normal planets. We can add one too as colonists. Our normal trick for altering the lighting on a planet with real day lengths is to put some orbital mirrors or shades up in a 24 hour period. And that's a lot trickier with a moon though, as the distance for a 24 hour orbit around it is likely outside that 1 9th orbital distance rule of thumb we mentioned earlier that a moon cannot be stable if its orbital distance from a planet is more than a ninth the distance that planet is from its sun, and the same rule applies to submoons. A 24 hour orbit of Earth for instance, which for us is geosynchronous, occurs at 40,000 kilometers from Earth, a tenth the distance to the far less massive moon, meaning perturbation from the moon is pretty small and not even a thousandth the distance to the sun. Many large moons would have a 24 hour orbital period around them for a satellite or submoon that was safely inside that 1 to 9 ratio. Perturbation, especially with other moons around, is going to be a big deal, but when it comes to solar mirrors and shades, we can correct even pretty big deviations by remembering they're basically solar sails and thus can function as statites or lagites. See our episode The Megastructural Compendium for more details on those. When it comes to large orbital stations though, rather than thin mirrors, things like O'Neill cylinders, then those higher orbits get a lot trickier, and you probably would need computers constantly coordinating landings and takeoffs of ships from them to help with station keeping. We have often contemplated settling moons of gas giants though, see colonizing Jupiter for more discussion, and in many cases these mini solar systems will be preferable colonization targets so long as you're not focused on having a planet with classic open air and skies. I thought we would wrap up today though by considering two hypothetical Earth twins. First, we will look at an effective double planet, Njord, twin to its larger partner Skadi, an ice giant, named for the Norse ice giantess and winter goddess Skadi and her husband Njord, and hopefully I'm not butchering the pronunciation too much. Second, we will look at the planet Jill, orbiting the brown dwarf Tartar, which we'll say is 50 Jupiter masses. Jill Tartar is the astronomer who coined the term brown dwarf and is the former director of SETI since I don't feel like trying to borrow any more names from mythology. Now ice giants are generally fairly dense compared to smaller gas giants, Saturn is the least dense planet but once you go up in mass much beyond that, gas giants and brown dwarfs all fall into a fairly narrow range of diameters and just keep getting denser until they hit the conditions to ignite as red dwarfs. Scotty is not as big as Neptune but rather a Hycian planet 8 times as massive as Earth, and Njord orbits it roughly every 24 hours at a distance of around 55,000 miles or 89,000 kilometers. This is the orbit around the Berry Center, which won't be in either planet. As we discussed way, way back in our Double Planets episode, we loosely set the definition of double planet as when the masses are close enough that the Berry Center, the place both bodies actually orbit, is not inside the larger world, like it is for Earth and the Moon. Njord and Scotty both have life on them, likely of shared origin. Life started on one and some asteroid impact or volcano managed to spread some small and tough microbes to the other. Unlike some examples in sci-fi, they do not share atmospheres you can fly between, Onderon and Duk Sun from Star Wars coming to mind, and I don't think you could achieve that except by artificial means like we had with the Acheron River in Colonizing Pluto. Njord is tightly locked to Scotty but not the reverse, and again has an Earth-like mass, day length, and years too, 
opening a slightly dimmer K9 star. Njord is cooler than Earth and would be much more so, but enjoys tidal heating from Scotty. Scotty itself has deep oceans under a thick hydrogen rich atmosphere, and nothing from Njord could survive there without help, but many larger organisms live on Njord in its own vast and dark seas. Thus, when technology arose on Njord, their Apollo project had no special problem reaching Scotty for orbiting, but getting robot scout missions down to the surface and able to transmit back up took a few more decades, and their first crewed missions didn't take place for a few decades later, when they are roughly parallel to modern Earth technology. Those were necessarily colony missions from the outset because the escape velocity from Scotty is almost double Njord's or Earth's, and so getting there is easy and so is getting down to the surface, but to stay in touch they need to have both orbital facilities and large blimp outposts in the atmosphere. Down on the surface the settlements are essentially a mix of boat and submarine, as they need to keep a lower pressure inside than the very high surface pressure of Scotty. For this reason the Njord didn't enjoy any special advantages in early colonization efforts, Scotty's close proximity and being host to life made it easier to get to and a big focus for their civilization. After all, Scotty is more than twice as wide as Earth and five times closer than the Moon is to Earth, making it forty times wider in the sky of Njord than the Moon is on Earth and over a thousand times brighter, making it very present in the psyche of the people of Njord, even compared to our own relationship with the Moon, hanging there as a vast blue ball dimmer but much bigger than their more orange-colored sun. What's more, There's an entire continent on Njord that is on the outer hemisphere of the planet and over which Scotty is never visible, and there are sometimes harsh feelings between the people of that continent and the inner hemisphere, who accuse them of worshipping Scotty, and are firmly convinced the giant kraken of Scotty are the embodiment of the demons of yore. So it was a hard effort to get to Scotty and didn't translate too well onto any other wards in their star system, none of which got an outpost let alone a colony for a few more centuries. Over on Jill, the largest of the moons the gas supergiant or brown dwarf of Tartar, the process was a bit different. There too the star is a bit dimmer than our own, and Jill and Tartar are not even vaguely double planets, as Tartar outmasses Jill 16,000 to 1. Jill orbits Tartar 661,000 miles or 1,064,000 kilometers out, and does so every 24 hours. Tartar is far more massive than Jupiter, nearly 50 times as much, and yet it actually has a smaller radius than Jupiter does. Thus it is still huge in the sky of Jill, but not nearly as much as Jupiter is to Io or Scotty is to Njord, even though it vastly outmasses both combined. It's about 10 times wider and 100 times brighter than our own moon, and has a massive magnetic field that causes amazing auroras on Jill. Jill has its own submoon, the somewhat unimpressive Jack, which orbits it every 36 hours, and even though much closer than our own moon, it is just a few hundred kilometers in radius, so it isn't drowning them in sub-moonlight. It was very easy for the first astronaut from Jill to reach Jack, it's just not as far uphill as our own moon is, and Jack and Jill are but two of over 100 known moons in orbit of Tartar, which also has its own Trojan asteroid belt, each half of which has more bodies in it than our own Trojans and asteroid and Kuiper belt combined. So for the people of Jill, spreading to the mini solar system around Tartar was relative child's play, hampered only by the rather high levels of radiation in space there. Within a few centuries of their first experiments with rockets, they had an outpost or colony on every rock worth naming, and even a few real space-based nations. After all, while getting off Jill was no easy task, all those smaller moons had low gravity and were far closer to each other than planets in our own solar system even allowing real-time if rather laggy phone calls. They came to think of themselves more as the Tartarish than the Jillianites, and were in a great position to launch themselves into interstellar space. Once out there of course, they generally found the moons of gas giants far more preferable as future homes, and their own steady efforts were rather hampered as it was centuries before they ever thought to try to find Earth-sized moons that directly orbited suns all on their own and spawned life. It just didn't occur to them to look for life on those occasional pale blue dots they saw around some stars, especially that one with the four gas giants, the biggest of which was barely a fly speck compared to Tartar and much too far from its own sun to host life. 
so we'll get to our schedule and announcements in a moment, but as a quick side note, this episode was originally titled Colonizing Giant Moons, but the script changed focus a bit during writing. I recently made a bonus episode that's a loose companion to today's topic, contemplating how we could colonize binary star systems that is out exclusively on Nebula, my streaming service, and explores more of what the problems for life emerging on, or settling on, worlds that aren't your traditional case of one big planet orbiting one single yellow sun. Also, for folks who do not know, outside this channel I wear a number of additional hats, and one of them is overseeing elections in my area. I am still on the governing board, but I just stepped down from being the chairman of that the same day I took over as the president of the National Space Society last month. One of the more hair-raising things we have to deal with are the non-stop cyber attacks on election security, one of the more serious ones having happened just this week, and thankfully all have been foiled without getting to the last line of defense. It is both a grim reminder though how pervasive cyber attacks are now and on a happier note that you can defend yourself very well by taking some simple steps, like never using the same password at different websites or different accounts, always checking the address on emails sent to you, and switching two-factor authentication onto everything. Another critical piece of the puzzle to help shield you from having your browsing and personal data spied on is using a virtual private network, or VPN like NordVPN because it ensures that with just one click, your data and browsing is getting encrypted and sent through one of their many thousands of servers throughout the world, an added benefit of which is that I don't have to worry about viewing or shopping limitations based on where I am, like if some video is blocked in whatever country I'm visiting. But NordVPN isn't just a VPN, their threat protection shields me from malware, trackers, and ads, while their dark web monitor notifies me if someone leaks my credentials and their mesh net allows me to connect my devices remotely and securely. My data is always protected by next generation encryption and NordVPN doesn't track or share what I do online. NordVPN's new proxy browser extensions make it even easier to protect your privacy, let you bypass censorship, and keep you safe while you browse, use browser-based tools, or play browser games and even customize it to decide which website sees your real IP address or your VPN's IP. To try NordVPN out, risk-free, with a 30-day money-back guarantee, go to nordvpn.com slash IsaacArthur and enjoy NordVPN on up to 6 devices on any major platform, with 24-7 customer support to help you whenever you need it. That's nordvpn.com slash IsaacArthur. As a heads up, while we usually have our monthly live stream the last weekend of each month, my wife and I are off for anniversary this last weekend of April, and next month for Memorial Day weekend, I'm in Frisco, Texas, helping host the International Space Development Conference. So our live streams are the second to last weekend for both April and May, and we'll be having our monthly live stream Q&A Sunday, April 23rd at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Then we'll be returning to Earth in the near future to talk about smart cities and the future of automation in urban environments and how that will change them. Then we'll jump into May with a return to the Fermi Paradox to discuss Dysoni and Seti and how we might find Kardashev to civilizations. Then we'll look at a lot of the common misconceptions about life, the universe, and everything on May 11th. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.